One role we usually associate with government intervention or government activity is the regulation of monopolies. And we think of, uh, we think of legislation like the Sherman Antitrust Act as a way that we control the growth of monopoly market power and the ability of firms to come to dominate one industry. And the, the history of this kind of regulation teaches us a lot about the, the economic processes that drive uh, innovation and economic activity and whether or not uh, regulation in these natural monopoly situations actually provides value and makes consumers better off. Take for example the electricity industry. By the 1890s it's really starting to grow especially in large cities like New York and Chicago. Initially they were very rivalrous. A lot of firms entered the market to provide electric service in larger cities and competed against each other. Uh, the kinds of innovations that happened in this industry were of big scale. Large generators, lots of long wires uh, connecting large generators in places like Niagara Falls to cities like New York. And that changed the cost structure of the industry. It changed the cost structure of the industry in a way that the electric company that owned this generator, their fixed cost was very, very high for building these big generators, but then their cost for s serving an additional customer was really, really, really low. And so that meant that their average cost per unit of electricity they sold and their average cost per customer really fell and fell over the course of serving a large number of customers. And in economics, we call this economies of scale. And this economies of scale in the big technologies and in industries like electricity really make it challenging to have rivalrous competition. So in Chicago, for example, in the late 1890s, there were about a dozen different firms providing electric service in the Chicago market. But as they competed against each other, they competed so much that they were lowering their prices, lowering their prices, lowering their prices until price would go so low that they couldn't actually pay all of the fixed costs that they had incurred to build the generators in the first place. And not all of the companies could stay in the market. And that process over time led to the consolidation of the electricity industry in cities like New York and Chicago into one large firm. And that firm could, as a monopoly in that market, charge a high price to consumers. And that was very much a part of the, the kind of public interest motivation of regulation. The, this progressive era, suspicion of large corporate activity, suspicion of large companies, and also the progressive era belief in the ability of government regulation to stand in for competition and correct the imperfections that they saw. There's also a more kind of public choice motivation looking at the incentives and the interests of both policymakers and the industry. They have an incentive to embrace regulation because regulation constructs a legal entry barrier and says in a particular geographic territory you will be the only firm allowed to provide retail electricity service to the people living in this area and no one else is allowed to do that. In return for government protection of your monopoly power we will regulate the profits that you earn on your assets and in that process regulate the prices you can charge to consumers. And we're going to shoot for trying to keep those prices at around average cost per unit of output to try to keep prices as low as are sustainable in the long run but still consistent with the firm investing in assets and earning a return on their assets. And so that's the regulatory compromise and, uh, and that's one reason why industry actually embraced regulation in electricity.
one of the presumptions on which regulation is built in this industry is one of, of sort of stability, that we have a static environment, right? And so, you know, this is the cost structure in this industry, boom. This is what kind of assets firms are gonna build, boom. And so we can figure all that out and back out what the right profits are and what the right prices are. Uh, the information required to get that right is, I would argue, unknowable. You know, they just think, okay, here's this demand for electricity and we have to meet this demand. But now, especially with air conditioning, uh, we see demand fluctuating dramatically over the course of the day. And yet we pay this fixed average retail price that gives us as individual consumers no incentive to change our consumption even at five o'clock when it's 95 degrees out on an August afternoon. I would argue that, that today, here we, you know, here we are in, early in the 21st century, that now is when we're really seeing the cost of regulation in terms of how it stifles innovation. Uh, I attribute this to a misunderstanding in the late 19th and early 20th century about what competitive processes actually entail and what drives them and what they create. And that's where we are now, is trying to deal with the fact that the regulatory system of the past century uh, doesn't address you know, hasn't adapted to, hasn't evolved along with the ways we use electricity, um, the new ways we may generate electricity, including renewables. It, it hasn't evolved to take into account the growth of digital technologies that we can use to, you know, basically program and monitor our own electricity use and respond automatically to price changes. And so I think that's where we are now, is on the brink of, of recognizing the costs of regulation. We've focused for so long on the benefits to consumers of having these low, stable, fixed prices and universal service. But now these low, stable, fixed prices are leading to a lot of electricity consumption in peak hours when it's really expensive to provide it for us, and also the environmental concerns. You know, it's generating a lot of emissions in the process. And so those are the 21st century challenges.